Chapter 20 A Double Impulse When the sixth grade teacher ushered me in, the other kids inspected me, but not unlike I myself would study a new arrival. She was a warm, benevolent woman who tried to make this first day as easy as possible. She gave me the morning to get the feel of the room. That afternoon, during the reading lesson, she finally asked me if I'd care to try a page out loud. I had not yet opened my mouth, except to smile. When I stood up, everyone turned to watch. Any kid entering a new class wanted, first of all, to be liked. This was up uppermost in my mind. I smiled wider, then began to read. I made no mistakes. When I finished, a pretty blonde girl in front of me said, quite innocently, Gee, I didn't know you could speak English. She was genuinely amazed. I was stunned. How could this have been in doubt? It isn't difficult now to explain her reaction, but at age 11, I couldn't believe anyone thinks such a thing, say such a thing about me, or regard me in that way. I smiled and sat down, suddenly aware of what, what being of Japanese ancestry was going to be like. I wouldn't be faced with physical attack or, or with overt shows of hatred. Rather, I would be seen as someone foreign or as someone other than American, or perhaps not be seen at all. During the years in camp, I had never really understood why we were there nor had I questioned it much. I knew no one in my family had committed a crime. If I needed explanations at all, I conjured up vague notions about a war between America and Japan. But now, I'd reached an age where certain childhood mysteries began to make sense. This girl's guileless remark came as an illumination an instant knowledge that brought with it the first buds of true shame. From that day on, part of me yearned to be invisible. In a way, nothing would have been nicer for no one to see me. Although I couldn't have defined it at the time, I felt that if attention were drawn to me, people would see this girl had first responded to. They wouldn't see me. They would see the slant-eyed face. The Oriental. This is what accounts, in part, for the entire evacuation. You cannot deport 110,000 people unless you have stopped seeing individuals. Of course, for such a thing to happen, there had to have been a kind of acquiescence of the part of the victims. Some submerged belief that this treatment is deserved, or at least allowed. It's an attitude easy for non-whites to acquire in America. I hadn't inherited it. Manzanar had confirmed it, and my feelings at 11 went something like this. You are going to be invisible anyway, so why not completely disappear? But another part of me did not want to disappear, with the same sort of reaction that sent Woody into the army. I instinctively decided I would have to prove that I wasn't different, that it should not be odd to hear me speaking English. From that day forward, I lived with a double impulse, the urge to disappear and the desperate desire to be accepted. I soon learned there were certain areas I was automatically allowed to perform in, scholarship, athletics, and school time activities like the yearbook the newspaper, and student government. I tried all of these and made good grades because news editors held an office in the girls' athletic league. I also learned that outside school, another set of rules prevailed. Choosing friends, for instance, often depended upon whether or not I could be invited to their homes, whether their parents would allow this, and what is so infuriating looking back is how I accepted the situation. If refused by someone's parents, I would never say, go to hell, or I'll find other friends, or who wants to come to your house anyway? I would see it as my fault, 
the result of my failings. I was imposing a burden on them. I would absorb such rejections and keep on looking because for some reason, the scholarship society and the athletic league and the yearbook staff didn't satisfy me, were never quite enough. They were too limited or too easy or too, too obvious. I wanted to declare myself in some different way and old enough to be, re be marked by the internment, but still too young for the full impact of it to cow me. I wanted in. At one point, I thought I would like to join the Girl Scouts. A friend of mine belonged, that blonde girl who had commented on my reading. Her name was Redeen. Her folks had come west from Amarillo, Texas, and made a little money in the aircraft planes, but not enough yet to get out of Cabrilla homes. We found ourselves walking part way home together every day. Her fascination with my ability to speak English had led to many other topics, but she had never mentioned the Girl Scouts to me. One day I did. Can I belong? I asked, then adding an afterthought as if to ease what I, I knew her answer would have to be. You know, I'm Japanese. Gee, she said, her friendly face suddenly a mask. I don't know. But we can sure find out. Mama's an assistant troop leader. And then the next day, Gee, Jeannie, no, I'm really sorry. Rage may have been simmering deep within me, but my conscious reaction was, All well. That's okay, Redeen. I understand. I guess I'll see you tomorrow. Sure, I'll meet you at the stoplight. I didn't hold that against her, any more than I associated her personally with the first remark she made. It was her mother who had drawn the line, and I was used to that. If anything, Redeen and I were closer now. She felt obligated to protect me. She would catch someone staring at me as we walked from home from school, and she would growl, What are you looking at? She's an American citizen. She's got as much right as anybody to walk around on the street. Her outbursts always amazed me. I would much rather have ignored those looks than challenging them. At the same time, I wondered why my citizenship had to be so loudly affirmed, and I couldn't imagine why affirming it would really make any difference. If so, why hadn't it kept me out of Manzanar? But... I was grateful when Redeen stuck up for me. Soon we were together all the time. I was teaching her how to twirl baton, and this started a partnership that lasted for the next three years. I hadn't forgotten what I learned in camp. My chubby teacher had taught me well. Redeen and I would practice in the grassy plots between the buildings, much as I used to do in the fire breaks near Block 28. Behind the back, between the legs, over the shoulder, high into the air above the two-story rooftops, watching it, timing its fall for the sudden catch. We practiced the splits and bending backwards, the high step strut, and I saw myself as a queened princess leading orchestras across a football field, the idol of cheering fans. There happened to be a Boy Scout drum and bugle corps located in the housing project next to ours. They performed in local parades, and they were looking for some baton twirlers to march in front of the band. That fall, Radin and I tried out, and we suited them just fine. They made me the lead majorette in the center between Radin and Gloria, another girl from the seventh grade. Those two wore blue satin outfits to accent their bright blonde hair. My outfit was white, with gold braid across the chest. We all wore white, calf-high boots and boat-shaped hats. We worked out trio routines and practiced every weekend with the boys, marching up and down the streets of the project. We performed with them at our junior high assemblies, as well as in the big band reviews each spring, with our batons glinting out in front of the bass drums and snares and shiny bugles, their banners, merit badges, 
khaki uniforms and their squared off military footwork. This was exactly what I wanted. It also gave me the first sure sign of how certain intangible barriers might be crossed. The Girl Scouts was much like a sorority of a kind I would be excluded from in high school and later on in college. And it was run by mothers. The Boy Scouts was like a fraternity and run by fathers. Redeen and I were both maturing early. The boys in the band loved having us out there in front of them all the time, bending back and stepping high in our snug satin outfits and short skirts. Their dads, mostly Navy men, loved it too. At that age, I was too young to consciously use my sexuality or to understand how an Oriental female can fascinate Caucasian men. And of course, far too young to see that even this is usually just another form of invisibility. It simply happened that the attention I first gained as a majorette went hand in hand with a warm reception from the Boy Scouts and their fathers. And from that point on, I knew intuitively that one resource I had to overcome the war distorted limitations of my race would be my femininity. When Woody came back from Japan and when Ray came home on leave from the Coast Guard, they would tease me about the short skirts we wore and about my legs, which were near the other extreme from the heavy thighed Dekon Ashi of the ballet dancers of Manzanar. They called me Gobo Ashi after the long brown twig-like root vegetable Gobo. They laughed, but they would show up for parades whenever they were in town, proud of their neighborhood celebrity. It was a pride that Papa didn't share. While I was striving to become Miss America of 1947, he was wishing I'd be Miss Hiroshima of 1904. He would counsel me on the female graces as he understood them on the need to conceal certain parts of the body, on the gaudiness of smiling too much. But his taste could not compete with a pull from the world outside our family. For one thing, not much of our family remained. Though larger than the rooms at Manzanar, this apartment was still cramped, forcing us kids outside. We ate in shifts. Mama was gone most of the time. And worst of all, I had lost respect for Papa. I never dared show this, but it was true. His scheme for setting up a housing cooperative had failed. With blueprints in hand, he tramped through the Japanese community to hostels, trailer courts, other housing projects like ours, trying to find families who would invest in it. Few had money. Those who did were terrified to let any of it go. And the very idea of banking on some kind of matching support from the government seemed laughable after the internment experience. Papa needed an enterprise he could manage with, within the family. He decided that a fortune could be made catching shrimp and abalon along the coast of Mexico, then bringing it back to dry and sell in Southern California. Woody was out of the army by this time and looking for work. As a citizen, he could get a commercial license. So at intervals, he would rent a boat, take it down to en Ensenada or below, load up with abalone, bring, it, bring the catch home, and all of the rest of us would spend days cleaning and cutting up the meat and stringing it out to dry in the bedrooms. For months, the apartment reeked of drying seafood. It was almost a brilliant scheme. In 1947, no one was yet drying Ab abalon commercially, but there was a small worm that kept attacking drying meat. Papa could never figure out how to control it. This plan went to pieces. His failures were sharpened, in an odd way, by Woody's return. He came back from Japan with his mustache thicker and bearing a sword that had been in the family for 300 years, a gift from Aunt Toyo. He brought other trophies, painted scrolls, lacured trays, things he would have valued only slightly before the war. All of this delighted Papa, 
filled him, filled him with pride for his son, who had returned a larger man. With a sure sense of himself, and of where we all had come from. Yet, while Woody grew, Papa seemed to shrink, losing potency. Their roles had been reversed. Before the war, he had been the skipper. Now he depended more and more on Woody, who had, who had youth and a citizen's mobility, who could license the boat or cross borders easily. Ever more vulnerable, Papa began drinking heavily again and I would watch it with sorrow and disgust, unable then to imagine what he ha he was going through. Too far into my own junior high school survival, I couldn't understand why he was home all day when Mama had to go out working. I was ashamed of him for that, in a deeper way for being what had led to our imprisonment, that is, for being so un undulterably Japanese. I would not bring my friends home for, for fear of what he would say or do. When he refused to show up for the parades I marched in, this separated me from him that much more. While the events he did show up for left me miserable with embarrassment. One night, the local PTA held an afterwards dinner for all the students in the scholarship society. I was among them, and this was the sort of achievement Papa encouraged. He and Mama dressed up for the dinner. They overdressed. It was the first time they had mixed socially with Caucasians since leaving camp. Papa seldom spoke to Caucasians during those years, or at any time afterward. When he did it, it was a point of honor to appear supremely dignified. He still thought of himself as an aristocrat. He bought himself a brand new single-breasted suit of brown, worsted for the occasion, with a matching brown vest and a brown and yellow fl flowered silk tie. Mama wore a maroon crepe dress with long sleeves, a necklace of shimmering gold discs, and a black Persian lamp coat I had not seen since before the war. She wore her hair in an upsweep. I knew she felt elegant and glad to be there. She smiled continually smiled at everyone, as if to make up for Papa's solemn courtesies. When it came time for each student to be presented a certificate, the parents were introduced. Most of them stood up hastily or waved from their chairs, like Radine's dad, a big, ruddy Texan just as unfamiliar with the scene as Papa was. He blushed, grinning foolishly, and everybody grinned back, loving him. I was standing at the head of the table, shaking the principal's hand, when Papa rose, his face ceremoniously grave, and acknowledged the other parents with his most respectful gesture. He pressed his palms together at his chest and gave them a slow, deep Japanese bow from the waist. They received this with a moment of careful, indecisive silence. He was unforgivably a foreigner then. Foreign to them, foreign to me, foreign to everyone but Mama, who sat next to him smiling with pleasant modesty. Twelve years old at the time, I wanted to scream. I wanted to slide out of the sight under the table and dissolve. 